Paul writes, if then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not on earthly things, not on things that are on earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we believe that if we have been saved by your grace through faith in your Son, that we have in fact been raised with him. We glory in that thought, Lord, that you have delivered us from death and raised us to everlasting life with Christ right now. We ask, Lord, that you would forgive us that in light of this truth, we continue to seek and set our minds on things in this earth and not upon Christ and not upon the things that are above. We desire, Father, for you to draw us to Christ this morning as you illuminate our hearts and minds with your word, that we would become a people so fixed by the hope of the gospel to be brought at the revelation of Christ that our hearts and minds will be captivated now and for all eternity by your Son. This has transforming power. This can change us from the inside out. And so we ask that you be gracious with us, Father, and it will take your grace. Do this great work in us, we pray, that we might be a people that bring you honor and glory now and forever. In Christ's name, amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> if you have your Bible, please open up to Colossians chapter 3. We made it to chapter 3. <laughs> 10 weeks or 11, we made it. Very thankful. In the previous chapter, if you were here with us, Paul had concluded that section with some warnings. He said in chapter 2, verse 8, see to it that no one takes you captive. Chapter 2, verse 16, don't let anyone judge you. Verse 18, don't let anyone disqualify you. And as he wraps up these warnings for the church in Colossae, and we would say the church throughout the centuries, he then tells us how we are to live as true Christians, as those who have been raised with Christ. And he does this for the Colossians because they need an answer back. They need to be good apologists. But they need to not only give right doctrine to the Judaizers who are trying to convince them to follow human tradition and mysticism and Gnosticism, he wants them to answer back with their lives. He wants the Judaizers to see a people so changed and transformed by the living God that they too would drop the foolishness that they had embraced and follow Christ instead. Life and practice of the right doctrine. He, had already, he has already established for us, my beloved, if you have not been here, the absolute supremacy of the preeminent God-man, Jesus Christ. He has already established for us the work that Christ completed on the cross to make you whole right now. So if you are in Christ, you lack nothing. You are complete in him. No add-ons, no salvation supplements, no asceticism, no vision, no worship of angels. If you are in Christ, you are complete. Amen. Amen. The Judaizers put forth a worldly religion. They argued asceticism and self-abasement. They argued about food and drink and fasting, festivals, new moons, Sabbath day celebrations. They advocated the worship of angels and the, the believing in visions. They had rules made up by men, do not handle, do not taste, do not touch, all man-made, all rules and regulations that had no power to save and no power to transform. The life of a true Christian, Paul says here, will be one that seeks after and sets his mind on the things that are above, 
not the things on earth. It is a life that is lived hidden in Christ to be revealed when Christ comes again in all his glory. So this morning, I, I want to take a small bite, although I would not argue these verses are small, but I want to look at verses 1 through 4 in Colossians 3 because what Paul does here is he establishes the summary or the premise of the Christian life. What does it really look like? What does it look like to live as a person saved by grace through faith in Christ alone? And then over the next several weeks, we will continue in chapter 3 and into chapter 4 where he gives some detail to this. But we have enough on our plate right now. This morning, I want us to see three things. Number one, that we are to seek the things above. Number two, we are to set our minds on the things above. And number three, we are to rejoice and live as though we are hidden with Christ in God because we are. And we'll explain, or I'll try to explain what that means. So number one, if you are with me, seeking the things above. He starts off here in verse one of chapter three with an if-then assumption. He's making a statement about the Colossians, who they already are. Look at verse one. Paul said, if then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. He says, if then, if you have been raised, if you are truly a new creature, if you're alive in Christ, then you want to seek out, set your mind on that which is above, not what which is below. And he has established this new life In great detail, if you haven't been paying attention, chapter 1, verse 4, he says, We heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and the love that you have for all the saints. Chapter 1, verse 12, The Father has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints. Chapter 1, verse 22, He has, God has now reconciled you in His body of flesh by His death. Chapter 2, verse 6, As you received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in Him. Chapter 2, verse 10, you have been filled in him who is the head of all rule and authority. Chapter 2, verse 11, you were circumcised by the circumcision of Christ. Verse 12, you were buried with him in baptism, raised with him in faith. Verse 13, made alive together with him. Verse 20, with Christ you died to the elemental spirits of the world. We get the point. If you are in Christ, you are a new creature, you are alive, you've been forgiven of your sins, and you've been set free from the power of Satan and and the demons. So Paul says, if this is all true, if you've been raised with him, then we must live as these new creatures. We must live as such. Look at verse 1 again. You have, past tense, been raised with Christ. He says this as a fact. This is truth. This is who we are. This is where we reside. And he says that because the work of Christ on Calvary was sufficient to cultivate a community of believers that have such a vital, life-giving relationship with Jesus Christ right now. It's as though we are with him now. That's how intimate it is. You've been raised with him, and you say, well, let's be real for a minute. I'm sitting here in this church listening to you. I obviously am not raised with him. How can Paul make that statement? How can you make that statement? In one sense, you have yet to be raised. You will be one day if you're in him. And yet in another very real sense, you have been raised with Christ. Undeniably, there's a a mystical aspect to this language, but it is so wonderful and so profound. It's not figurative. It's not symbolic language. It's not a metaphor. In the Greek, raised with Christ, it's real, it's active, it's past tense, and it's ongoing. Paul said in Ephesians 2, 6, in case we think that he's not clear, he said, God raised us up with Christ, listen to this, and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. Active, past tense, ongoing. So if it's not symbolic, and it's not metaphoric, what what is he talking about? What is this? How have you been raised? How have I been raised? 
He's talking about the vital, life-giving, life-saving, life-sustaining relationship you now have with the Son of God. So real and so profound that you can know him now, and you can enjoy him now, and you can follow him right now because you have been raised with him. This is the new spiritual life that Paul calls us to. He said, seek the things that are above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. He says, seek it because that's where your life really is. Seek it because that's your home. It's who you really are. The Judaizers had not been raised with Christ. They didn't see the Colossians having been raised with Christ. And so they came up with all these human traditions and decrees, do not taste, do not touch, do not handle. But the believer who has been raised is called to seek the things above. They advocated seeking the things here on earth, thinking that somehow if you engaged in this external religion that you could be transformed on the inside. Paul says, no, you got it all backwards. Transformation starts on the inside and works its way out. The heart and mind captivated by Christ and the things that are above, not the things here on earth. John MacArthur put it like this, pertaining to the things above. I love it. He said, the moment you were saved, God granted to you the capacity to enter and to live consciously in his presence. The moment that you were saved, spirituality is then a heavenly kind of life. That means a life that focuses on things above, not on earthly things. It is a preoccupation with the divine. It is an upward look in life. I like that, a preoccupation with the divine. This word here, to seek, in the Greek, it's zeteo, and it literally means to desire or to long for or to reach out, to grasp onto, that you might make it your own. So this is not to seek after and see what you can find. This is to get and to hold. It's very much what Paul was talking about in Philippians chapter 3 when he said, I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection. He says in verse 12, not that I have already obtained this or am already perfect, but I press on to make it my own because Christ has made me his own. That's the seeking we're talking about. Pressing, striving, not to be saved because you're already saved, not to be made complete because you are complete, but because Christ has made you his own. And if Christ has made you his own and you don't seek after him every moment of every day, then you don't realize who he is. So what what specifically was Paul straining for? the things that are above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of the Father. When you hear that read, do not think, do not have this image of this throne with God the Father sitting upon the throne and this little seat off to the right where Jesus is seated on that. The right hand of God is God's almighty power. It is now enjoyed and exercised by the God-man, Jesus Christ. The incarnate raised from the dead, ascended into heaven, God, man, Jesus Christ. And so Paul says, you want to seek after the things that our Savior now has. Grace is to be poured out again and again from this position of authority as a man. So what are they? I mean, what is he talking about? What are these things that we are to seek? It's all the grace all the blessings of this relationship we now have with God through Jesus Christ. We are to seek after, to know him, to know him more today than you did yesterday, to enjoy this sweet relationship that you have with God through Christ is to seek after the things that are above, to seek the heart of our Savior that you might go through life seeing things as he sees things, There's to seek the things above. To hear people talk as our Savior hears people talk. To long for your life and the life of others as he longs for them. This is to seek the things that are above. To seek the things above is to seek the meekness and the kindness and the tenderness of our Lord. It is to to pursue patience and wisdom and forgiveness that we now have in the power of the Holy Spirit. To seek the things above is to pursue a joy that has no bounds, a courage that only fears God. It is to obtain, by God's grace, 
a heavenly perspective of all things in life. A heavenly perspective. It is to go through this life knowing that God is creator, that he is a thrice holy God. It is to know in the depth of your heart that you are sinful through and through, and that apart from Jesus Christ saving you, you will perish. It is a heavenly understanding that Christ will come again in glory, and he will, as the Apostles' Creed says, he will judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end, and therefore you will open your mouth, and you will testify to Christ. You will share the good news of the gospel of grace with friends and family that they too might repent and they too might believe. This is grasping the heavenly things. It is to live daily by faith and not by sight. It is to know who Christ is, what he has done for you, and what he will do for you when he comes again in glory, when he reconciles all things back to God. My beloved, Paul says, these are the things you must seek for. We're going to see here in a minute, in the next verse, not the things of earth, all the things that we seek after. I was so convicted as I was singing, thinking how much of my time is seeking after the temporal, physical well-being, temporal pleasure. How much of my time is seeking after those things that are not of heaven? And yet Paul says here, true Christians are captivated by the things above. This is what we seek. He gives us another point here. Seek after the things above and set your mind on the things above. Point number two, set your mind on the things above. Look at verse two with me. Paul says, set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. So he's now developing further verse one. At first he says, seek after, and now he tells us a means of grace that we do that. It's by setting our minds, focusing in on the things that are above, not the things that are on earth. I do not believe that the apostle Paul would have been a great fan of John Lennon, especially his hit single, Imagine. I, I heard the song the other day, and it just struck me, especially this, this particular line that I, I guess I just wasn't cognizant of. Imagine there's no heaven. Horrific thought. Imagine there's no heaven. It's easy if you try. No hell below. Above us only sky. And then he said, imagine all the people living for today. Today. Do you realize that's the exact opposite of what Paul is teaching here? Paul's lyric would be, set your minds on the things above, not on the things here on earth. Set your minds. It's inadequate in the English. The King James actually renders it, set your affections. So if we do, if we take the ESV and the King James and we put them together, we have the meaning of what Paul is saying here. The Greek word is phroneo, and it means to cognitively and emotionally fix yourself on someone or something. So heart and mind, thinking, and feeling coming together internally to manifest some external behavior. And that's what Paul's driving at here. If, for example, my beloved, I, if I think about a good friend who I know is lonely, and I, I'm thinking about their loneliness, if I truly love them, it will cultivate rightly in me a, a brokenness. I will empathize with their loneliness but it won't stay there. It'll be in my thoughts. It'll be in my heart. And I will then do what? I will go out to them. I will reach out to them. And I'll say, come to my house. Have dinner with me. Have coffee with me. Can I help you in your loneliness? So this seeking after is to bring about an internal transformation that leads to external behavior, righteousness through our hands and our feet. The Judaizers were all about the things of this world the physical things, the asceticism, the new moons, the religious traditions they believed could transform them spiritually. Paul is saying, no, God transforms us spiritually from the inside out. And so he says, set your minds, your thoughts and your feelings on the things that are above. And if you do, and if you do, you'll be changed. You cannot be a person who daily fixes his mind or her mind on the things above, Jesus Christ, his kingdom, and not be transformed by it. You will change. You must change. 
I love how the Apostle Paul said in Romans chapter 12, verse 2, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by what? By the renewing of your mind. By setting your mind on the things that are above. My beloved, the more that I contemplate the glorified body that Christ is going to give to me when he comes again in glory, the less I am concerned about my inability to hear or see or walk well. I get a new body, and so do you if you're in Christ. If my mind is captivated, I mean truly captivated by the joy I have in God through Christ. If heavenly joy captivates me daily, then I can I can move through life without being obsessed about that new job or that next degree or that next must-see movie that I haven't seen yet because my joy is in Christ. The same is true if we meditate and think about the things on earth. If my mind is focused upon all my neighbor's stuff and he has more stuff than I do, then I'm going to work really hard to get all the things that he has because my mindset is upon his possessions. If I fix my mind upon having the perfect home now, perfect location, perfect paint, perfect interior, then I will miss the heavenly home that God has promised me. If I seek hard after that promotion or that possession, that one that I got to have, I will neglect the great blessings that God has put into my life, my wife, my children, the church, Christ, the word of God. So Paul says, do not set your minds on the things here on earth. Do not do it. Now, we have to be very careful in handling this verse. This is not a prohibition to now consider all things on earth worthless or evil. Many of the things that we enjoy on a daily basis are blessings from God, given to us by God to enjoy. So this is not a picture. Paul is not painting a picture of the hyper-spiritualist who cannot relate to people, cannot hold down a job. This is not who Paul is describing. It is a person that has a heavenly orientation. It is a person who rises daily and their mind is captivated by the things of God, by his son Jesus Christ, by the word that he's given us, by the kingdom that is at hand, by the work that he's called us to do. It's a heavenly orientation, a meditation upon Christ the king. If you have that, then there's a right ordering of your life on earth. If, you're, if your meditations and your thoughts and your heart and mind are upon Christ and his kingdom, then we can move through this life rightly. That's why I had Jeremy read Matthew chapter 6, verse 33, when Jesus said, seek first what? Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and then all the other things will be added unto you. All the things that we worry about, all the things we focus on, so much we worry about, we talk about, we can't sleep at night because of it. He says, you have the wrong orientation. Think of me. Think of my kingdom. Think of what's coming to you when I come again in glory. And then all these other things will have their right place. You won't overvalue or undervalue the material world. But you will relate to God's creation in a manner most pleasing to him. You will relate to God's creation as he created you and saved you to relate to his creation. Remember, before the fall, God looked upon creation in Genesis chapter 1 and he said what? It is very good. It's very good. So much good in God's glorious creation. Contaminated by sin, yes. But he calls us to engage in that. So if my heart and mind, if my heart and mind is captivated by the love that Jesus Christ has for the church, and, and I understand the command to love my wife as Christ loves the church, then I can love her, not as an idol, and I can enjoy my marriage, not as an idol, but in the context of the heavenly things. If my heart desires most to glorify Christ by raising my children to know and love and serve the Lord, and that moves me more than wanting to be their friend. Then I can be the dad they don't like that much sometimes. I can be the dad that they say, all you're trying to do is strip my joy when they want to go headlong into sin with their friends. And I'm okay with that 
because Christ is first. His desire for them is first. We must not misunderstand, then, what Paul is saying here in verse 2. This is not a call to look upon the world and all creation and say, this is evil or not worth my time. Rather, it's a call for a reorientation of your heart and mind upon the heavenly things that you might be the most effective minister now here on earth. Right? That we become God's people who minister and love and help and share the gospel with the lost. In Jesus' high priestly prayer in John chapter 17, isn't this what he asked God for the disciples? He said, I do not ask that you take them out of the world. He's leaving, they're staying. I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. And then he said in verse 17, sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, so I have sent you into the world. The sanctification of our hearts and minds by the word of God, dwelling upon heavenly things, enables us to be the people God has created us to be. Servants. Messengers. If I desire what God desires, then I am set free from that which binds me here. If my orientation is on the things above, then we are set free from the greed and the possessions and the manipulation that binds us here. And we are able then to go to those who are still bound, those who are still stuck in their own flesh, those who are still lustful and glory starved, and we can bring to them who? We can bring to them the one who is seated at the right hand of the Father. We can bring to them the one who has power to set them free too. But we can only do this if our hearts and minds have been properly captivated by Christ and his kingdom. We are of no use to a fallen world if we live as fallen people. But what glorious instruments we become if by his grace we daily set our minds and seek after the things above that we might be transformative agents here in this fallen place. So last point is why should we listen to the Apostle Paul? I mean, the Judaizers, they were setting for us some pretty interesting stuff, right? Some man-made religions, things that we can do on our own power. Why should we listen to Paul? Why not listen to other false teachers who tell me that I can have my best life now and live in an earthly manner? Why not make my marriage most important? Why not make my job most important? Why not make as much money as I can if this is all I have? Because this is not all you have. Point number three, you are hidden. You are hidden in Christ with God. Look at, uh, let's go back to verse one. I want to read this. This is a continuous thought here. I don't want to break it up. Verse 1, if then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Verse 2, set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. And then he says why. Here it is, verse 3, for you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. You should smile when I say that. <laughs> verse 4, just the first part of verse 4. Oh, there's so much in that. I will try hard here. He said in chapter 2, verse 20, you have died to the elemental spirits of this world. You died with Christ. You're not bound by the things of this earth anymore. All the Judaism, all the lies, all the asceticism, all the false religion, he says, you're not subject to. Dead people do not care about things like clothes and food and work and cars. Have you asked them? Dead people do not care about false religion. They don't care about seeming pious. They don't care about engaging in asceticism or worshiping angels. They certainly do not care about man-made statements like do not handle, do not taste, do not touch. If you are in Christ, Christ died, you died. If you are in Christ, Christ rose, you rose with him. And you are dead to all this noise. You are a new creature, complete, forgiven, set free, 
and immune. You are, whether you know, you're immune to these lies. You say, well, why? You are hidden with Christ in God. The thought is utterly mind-blowing. The word hidden, crypto, it means to be concealed. You're hidden with Christ in God. You have a hiding place. And it is a glorious hiding place. It is not a place for a coward. It means several things. I'll give you a few. I think one thing that it certainly means is that because you are hidden with Christ in God, that the world doesn't understand you. They can't, they can't see you. They don't get you. And that makes sense, right? The Judaizers were teaching a man-made religion that if embraced, the world would see and understand. We're offered grace through faith. So when someone comes along and says, you need this or you need that to be complete in Christ or need to be a better Christian, they don't get you because you're already complete. The work was finished by Christ upon the cross. They don't know that you are already infinitely rich because the Holy Spirit dwells in you. They can't see you as you truly are. You don't see you yet as you truly are. So when the world says that you're a fool for spending so much time at church on Sunday, I mean, you're a fool getting up early and reading your Bible and praying to this imaginary God. When the church says you are a fool for giving all that money to the ministry of the gospel and to people overseas who you've never met, you're a fool. When they judge you, they judge you because they cannot see you. Did Paul not say in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, the natural man cannot understand the things of the Spirit of God, for they are spiritually discerned. They cannot see you. They cannot know you. That means no matter how hard you try to explain it to them, until they're saved by grace, they will not get it. Think back before you were saved. Think back at some of your Christian friends. I said horrible things to them. Horrible things. I made fun of them. I mocked them. I teased them. Why? I could not see them. And then Christ saves me by his grace. I come into the covenant community. I'm like, oh, that's it. Now I get it. I couldn't see them. They won't get your sacrificial love for one another. They won't get your desire to know God's word and live in accordance with it. They can't because they don't have Christ. Another thing, being hidden in Christ, being hidden with Christ in God means, I believe, that when God looks upon you, he sees Christ. And when he looks upon Christ, he sees you. You are hidden. You are intertwined. You are inseparable. You cannot separate God, Christ, you now if you're in him. You're hidden. You're hidden. The Judaizers wanted to give the Colossians tricks. And they were all, they were all tricks. You want to get closer to Christ? Do this trick. 1 Corinthians 6.17, Paul said, He who is joined to the Lord becomes what? One spirit with him. My beloved can you get any closer than being one in spirit with someone? Can you draw any closer? You cannot. And yet, if you are in Christ, you are one in spirit with him right now. No closer relationship. No greater intimacy or proximity. Can't have it. So when you, when you come into heaven and you enter into the presence of God, they're not going to say, where have you been all this time? We've been waiting for you. They're going to say, oh, come in. You've been here all along. You've been here all along. This is your place. This is your home. This is your family. This is your God. Knowing that you've been hidden with Christ should therefore bring a great sense of security to the believer. Amen. Great security. <clears throat> Listen, the world cannot find you. Satan cannot harm you. Sin cannot separate you. So let me ask you, my beloved, what can separate you from the love of God known in Christ Jesus? Let Paul answer it. Neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor things present nor things to come, nor powers nor height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. You are hidden. You are secure. There's no getting out. 
How glorious that you cannot be unsaved. How glorious you cannot unsave yourself. I would have a thousand times over. You're hidden. You are secure. So not only can you not be separated from the love of God in Christ Jesus because you're hidden in Christ, but when Christ comes again, you will appear with him. We're not going to be hidden forever. We're only hidden now. When Christ comes again in glory, we will appear with him. Look at verse 4. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. You have been joined spiritually, one in spirit with Jesus Christ, the God-man. And so when Jesus said in John 14, I am the way and the truth and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me, he's talking about you. You are now participating in this unity with him. When Paul says that Christ is our life, he's saying to know Christ is to know life. To have Jesus is to have eternal life. You've heard people say things like, this is my life. If I would ever lose my voice, I, not me, if, if I would ever lose my voice, I would die because singing is my life. If, if I ever was rendered to a wheelchair, I would die because dancing is my life. The Christian says, no, none of those things. Christ is my life. You ever wonder why in Genesis chapter 2, the description of the garden the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and the tree of life, the tree of eternal life. In the garden where God communed with man was eternal life. Genesis chapter 2, you can fast forward to the very end of the Bible. Revelation chapter 22, we have a very similar picture of life being in the presence of God, running from his throne as water and trees on either side. Let me read to you. Revelation 22, beginning at verse 1. Then the angel showed me, speaking to the apostle John, the river of the water of life, bright as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb. Through the middle of the streets of the city, also on either side of the river, the tree of life with its 12 kinds of fruit. And then he says in verse 3, and his servants will worship him. They will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads. Christ is your life if you are hidden in him right now. But when he comes again in glory, all that hiding will be made known. No longer will any of us be hidden. No longer will the world not know your true identity. No longer, my beloved, will you be confused about your true identity. That which you still do not see in their safe state, it will be made known, fully exposed, the name of God written upon your forehead. No more questioning, no more hiding. No more worrying about whether or not you are truly saved. No more worries. You will be fully alive in the presence of God, the angels, and all the saints who have been redeemed for centuries. You'll be fully alive. And that veil, John says, will be taken away. That veil that, that clouds and confuses so many today will be lifted up. He says in Revelation, John, Revelation 19, John tells us, listen to this. Then I saw heaven opened. What is that? When heaven is opening, all that is hidden is now made known. Everything is made known. All creation, all mankind. And behold, he says, a white horse. The one sitting on it is called faithful and true. Who is that? It's Jesus Christ, the God-man. And then he says in verse 13, he is clothed in a robe dipped in blood, the blood of the cross, and the name by which he is called is the word of God. Now listen, this is your part. Verse 14, and the armies of heaven arrayed in fine linen, white and pure, were following him on white horses. When Jesus Christ appears in glory, you will appear in glory. When Jesus Christ is no longer hidden to fallen man, you will no longer be hidden. You will come, I love this, you'll be arrayed in the heavenly garments of purity and holiness. You'll be advancing in the victory accomplished by Christ on your white horse. You better like riding. No longer judged. No longer disqualified. No longer deemed a fool because you do not submit to the rules of man. Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch. No more. The tables will be turned 
upside down, made right side up. Those who laughed at you because of your faith, those who judged you, those who condemned you, those who shunned you, when they see Christ coming in all of his glory, they will cry out to be hidden themselves. Those who are now known and fully exposed in all their sin will cry out to be hidden. Revelation 6, 16. Calling to the mountains and the rocks, they will say, fall on us and what? And hide us from the face of him who is seated upon the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. But on the great day of the Lord, there will be no hiding. No hiding on that day. Every man ever born will be raised up. Every soul will be brought before a thrice holy God, and all the books will be opened. Your entire life will be laid bare. No hiding for those of you in Jesus Christ who are hidden in Jesus Christ. When the judgment comes down, God the Father will say, paid in full by my son. Paid in full. That one goes free. That one comes in. That one enters my rest if you are hidden in Christ now. But for all those on that glorious and dreadful day who come before the living God, who are not hidden in Christ, who are not bathed in his blood, who have no righteous garment of purity and holiness to put on because of the work of Christ, they will be judged. And that judgment is an eternal judgment of damnation forever and ever in the lake of fire. Every sin perfectly adjudicated and every sin infinitely judged for all eternity. This truth, my beloved, I pray, does not make you smug if you are in Christ, but humble. This truth should not cause any delight of any kind in the unrepentant sinner not being saved. God doesn't delight in it. He said through the prophet Ezekiel in Ezekiel 18, do I take any pleasure in the death of the wicked, declares the sovereign Lord? Rather, he said, I, am I not pleased when they turn from their ways and they live? Of course he is. God rejoices when sinners repent and believe in Christ. He rejoices when those who are in rebellion against him as creator turn to the Savior to be saved. He rejoices when Christ becomes their life too. Not their dancing and not their singing, but Christ. Because he knows in that there is salvation. There is eternal life. My beloved, in order for us to be instruments of righteousness to this broken world, in order for us not to become judgmental or condemning, to bring the hope of the gospel to the lost so they might see Christ too. And they might be one who participates in riding on that white horse covered in purity and holiness on that day. Then we must be a people, listen now, we must be a people who set our minds and seek after the things above daily. Christ, his kingdom, the gospel of grace, we must daily be ensconced in it wrapped in it so that when we engage the fallen world we will not be as the world is when we engage the lost they will see the love of Christ in us when we come to them in humility and grace to talk about their standing to let them know that God is real that man is fallen that Christ will judge and Christ can save in order for them to hear you in that right love and that right grace, then your mind and your heart must be captivated upon God's love and God's grace or they will only hear you and they will hear judgment, they will hear condemnation. If we seek after and set our minds on the things of earth, we cannot be the salt that God's called us to be. Remember Christ said, what do you do with the salt that has lost its saltiness? It is thrown out and trampled underfoot by men to retain your salt, to retain the light daily fixed upon the things that are above. Christ your king, the gospel of grace, the kingdom to come, the word of God. I don't want to become complacent. I don't want to become covetous. I don't want to become judgmental. And yet if my mind is fixed upon the things of earth, that's the man I will be of no use to a holy God. But if we daily see ourselves, as Tim prayed, as ambassadors of Christ, you are here as an ambassador. You have a mission. 
You have a king that has called you to go out and to be salt and light, bringing purifying power, seeking the things that God seeks, bringing the good news that God has called us to bring. The Apostle John tells us in 1 John 3, 2 and 3, he said, we are God's children now. You're God's children now. And what we will be has not yet appeared. Now listen to this. But we know that when he, Jesus Christ, appears, we shall be like him because we shall see him as he is. And everyone who thus hopes in him purifies himself as he is pure. My friends, this is the great hope that we have that when Christ comes again in glory, we won't be destroyed. When Christ comes again in glory, you will see him, and you will, because you see him, you will be as he is. And that hope, John says, purifies. It has purifying power. Daily lifting our eyes up to heaven, and in so doing, becoming faithful, loving, grace-filled ministers here on earth. We're going to take communion. It is one of the two holy ordinances that we do as a church. It is a time when we, as a community of believers, stop and we reflect upon the sacrifice made by our Savior, Jesus Christ, broken body, spilled blood, to bring us into this community, to bring us into the kingdom, so that we don't have to go every day with our hearts and minds fixed upon all the temporal, the money, the work, the relationships. It's to reflect upon the work that he accomplished that we might daily set our minds and our hearts upon the things that are above. So during this time, I want to ask you to ask God to examine your heart. I want this to be a very practical communion service. Before Pastor Kurt comes up, I want you to ask God to reveal to you this. Are your primary meditations are your greatest desires the things of this earth? Yes or no? If it's yes, then now is the time to repent. Now is the time to ask God to forgive you for not being captivated by the Son. Seek forgiveness, repent, and turn from that. If you ask that question by His grace, heart and mind captivated by Christ and the things of this kingdom, and the answer is yes most of the time. I fail a lot, but that he is my life. Then praise God that he would encourage you to continue in that walk day after day until he calls you home or until he comes again in glory. Amen? So let's examine ourselves now as I pray. Heavenly Father, this is such glorious news that we have in fact been raised with Christ that you have hidden us in him, with you. And therefore, Lord, we are not subject to the bondage of this fallen world. We're not subject to the bondage of our own flesh. We need not wake up every day worrying, thinking, and desiring about all the things on this earth. You've set us free from that. And we can, by your grace, through your Holy Spirit, fix our heart and mind upon the things that are above those that are eternal, that which will last, your son, his kingdom, the promises he will bring and fulfill when he comes again in glory. I ask, Lord, that you would forgive us as a people for seeking after and setting our minds on so many things that you are not pleased with. We ask, Lord, that you would encourage us to daily look upon Christ, to know him better, to love him more, to walk in faith. We ask these things, Father, not only for the blessings that will be poured out upon this church and this community, but we ask it that you might be glorified for the magnification of your name, for the glorification of Jesus Christ, for the revealing of the Holy Spirit that is dwelling in us, but will too be revealed when Christ comes again. Do this for your glory, I pray. In Christ's name, amen.